Uh, the slides are already online at this bit.ly link. Um, I've updated them this morning based on the ones I'm presenting now rather than the uh, previous ones. Uh, this will take you through to the talks page on my website where the slides are embedded. Um, but you can also click through and view them in speaker deck as well if you want to follow along. Um, there's quite a few code samples and, and things going through. So depending on the projector, it might be better to uh, follow this yourself. So let's start by uh, looking at the sponsors. Uh, so Acquia are the Diamond sponsor. Wonder and Platform SH is Platform sponsors and Gold sponsors. Uh, I'm sure by now we've seen the signs around. Um, Rachel and myself and a few others are having a bit of a recruitment drive, the Drupal Association membership. Um, mine renewed just before this conference, so I've renewed it. So now I can keep telling other people to renew them. Um, so if, if your membership has expired or you're not a member of the Drupal Association, I'd highly encourage you to, uh, to become a member, uh, help fund the Drupal Association and then fund the work that they do uh, in achieving their mission with the Drupal community. So this talk is primarily for module and theme developers, people who want to know more about automated testing. Uh, if you're maybe looking to start writing your first test or tests, uh, we'll be focusing on Drupal 8 primarily. Um, I can mention Drupal 7 in a few places if, if you want that. And we'll be talking primarily about PHP unit rather than um, simple test or dhat or nightwatch or other testing frameworks. Uh, so we'll be talking about why we should write tests and what to test, different types of tests that we have available, how to run them, look at a real life example for one of my recent projects, and if we have time, hopefully, um, how to build a new module using test-driven development. I'm aware that this session finishes at one, and there's lunch, and we want to avoid the big queue, so let's see how we do for time. So some things about me. Uh, I'm a full-stack developer and system administrator based in the UK, in Wales. Uh, I'm a senior developer at a company called Microserve, based in Bristol. Um, Acquia certified Drupal 8 Grandmaster. Uh, I contribute KSE to Drupal 7 and Drupal 8 Core, uh, although more recently uh, I've been also using uh, Symfony, Laravel, Silex when that was a thing, uh, and Sculpin for static site generators. Uh, I've been using Drupal, I think it's 10 years of this at this point, so um, been quite a while. Uh, OP Davis, D A V I E S, is my handle on pretty much everything. Uh, and this is my blog at oliverdavis.uk, where I blog about Drupal and PHP and testing and other things. Uh, so again, slash talks um, goes to my talks page, where um, this talk is. Uh, there's my, a link to my Twitter account, my Drupal.org account, and then my GitHub account, where the example code for this talk is located as well, uh, as well as some other related things. Uh, let's see here. Yep, so say we're for a company called Microserve. Um, these are all of our, we're a specialist Drupal first agency. I think that's accurate. Um, we've always been sort of solely focused on Drupal. Uh, right now we started looking at more things, particularly on the front end um, and, and decoupled, etc. cetera. Um, these are our contact details. Uh, I've started, or I'm about to start writing a book uh, on Drupal testing. Uh, you can go to testdrivendrupal.com. This goes to a landing page on my website where I cover some of the things I'm hoping to cover in the book. Um, hope it, and after this conference, I'm going to spend a bit more time doing it, start putting together the first sort of couple of chapters, um, and start sending those out for free. Um, it will probably go on LeanPub uh, once it's nearly completed. Um, but you can go to this link and put in your email address and sign up for the mailing list. Uh, so as I say, I work for an agency. Um, I'm, I write custom modules and themes for clients. Uh, I can, can occasionally contribute to Drupal Core, as I said, uh, and I also maintain and contribute to various Drupal contrib projects. So testing sort of touches all of these three things. Uh, most of us here, I guess, probably know Tim Millwood. Um, this tweet was back in 2012, February 2012, asking if any of you wanted to become a maintainer of overwrite and options module, uh, which I did. Uh, so I became a maintainer in 2012. Uh, there were some existing tests already. I think this was Drupal 6. I think there was a Drupal 7 version as well at that point. Uh, I, at that, yes, 
there we go. So at this point, it was used on 11,000 or so sites, uh, mostly Drupal 6, some Drupal 7, still some Drupal 5. Uh, and then as of last month, it's currently used on almost 30,000 websites. Uh, still, oddly enough, some Drupal 5 sites, according to the update module, um, still some Drupal 6 sites, but obviously a lot more Drupal 7 and, and Drupal 8 sites now as well. Um, and writing tests, or extending the tests that we already had for this module, prevented regressions when I was adding new functionality, um, my own code, and also patches coming in from people in issue queue. Uh, I've got a good example of that I'll talk about later on. Um, and I'm pretty sure that this was the first module I ported over to Drupal 8, um, aided by and driven by the tests I already had in Drupal 7. Uh, well last time I checked, it was a 236 most used module on Drupal.org. Uh, as I said, critical to prevent the regressions. Uh, and this is why I started to get interested in testing, because I don't want to be responsible for breaking 23,000 websites. Uh, as well as, you know, I don't want clients ringing me up saying, only my website doesn't work. Likewise, I don't want 23,000 issues on the issue queue. Uh, interestingly, when I sent out a tweet, when I was about to start writing the book, I was saying, like, what type of things do you want to cover? And a lot of people were saying why to write the tests and how to know what to test, as well as necessarily how to write them. So we'll, uh, we'll cover this. So the main reason for wanting to write a test is to catch bugs earlier. Um, one of the, I organize a PHP user group in Bristol. One of the other organizers has done a full talk about essentially catching bugs earlier through testing and continuous integration. And the takeaway from that is the quicker we can find bugs, the less expensive they are to fix, both in terms of time and cost. So if we can catch them the worst time to find a bug is when it's been live for six months, people have been using it, you then need to fix it and then clean up after yourself and figure out how to put everything back into the right state. The best time to do it is before you've even shipped the code and when you've still got it locally, you can make that change very quickly, um, therefore being you know, less expensive. Peace of mind, um, as I said, I don't want 24,000 issues on the queue, so Knowing that I've got these tests means I've got peace of mind that if I'm changing things, I'm not breaking things to everybody else. Prevent the regressions. Um, write less code. If, if you're working a test-driven way, uh, if you write tests first and then code second, which is the way I tend to do it, um, you usually end up writing less code because you're only writing the code you need to make the test pass. So you sort of figure out what you're going to do during the test writing stage and not necessarily on the implementation code stage. Uh, they also serve as great documentation. So when I'm trying to figure out to do something in Drupal 8, because there's a lot more tests in Drupal 8, I can see how the tests are doing it and then mirror that myself in my own code. Uh, and also it's a Drupal core requirement. If you want to contribute to core, um, everything has to have tests now. We'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, and then also more important with Drupal 8 releases. So those are aware about semantic versioning, um, and Gabo was also talked this morning about having minor releases every six months. Well, that's really great because we can add new features into core. That also means that potentially they might break things in your site. So whereas in Drupal 7, maybe a, a module would work forever because there's no API changes there. In Drupal 8, it could only last up to six months depending on what you're doing. So having tests and then be able to run those tests before upgrading to the next minor version just gives that peace of mind that your code hasn't broken by upgrading to 8.5 or, or something. So as I mentioned, uh, it's a core requirement for writing tests now. Um, essentially, every patch has to go through a number of gates, uh, one of which being testing. Uh, and essentially, any new features should have tests and any new bugs should have a test showing that you've actually fixed the bug. Testing in Drupal specifically, um, in Drupal 7, there was a simple test module in core. Uh, I believe there's a contrib in Drupal 6 as well. Um, but in Drupal 7, it was included in core as the testing module. Uh, in Drupal 8, we still have a simple test module, but now we also have um, PHP unit uh, as a core dependency, which is sort of the de facto testing framework for any sort of PHP project unit testing. Um, it's used quite effectively by Symfony and Laravel and I was going to say countless other projects, not countless, but lots of them. Uh, and then there is a PHP unit initiative that is moving 
call test from the old simple test way to the new PHP unit format uh, with the intention then of deprecating simple test in Drupal 8 and removing it then in Drupal 9, potentially. Uh, so how do we write tests in, in Drupal 8? Uh, we write them as PHP classes with a, a .php extension. This is different to Drupal 7 where they were classes in a .test file. Uh, they live within a tests directory and then within an SRC directory within each module. And they live within a Drupal tests, then module name, namespace. So override node options module would be in Drupal tests, override node options, so snake case, lower case, underscores, um, machine name, machine module machine names. Um, each class name must match the file name and the namespace much, must match the directory structure. So because Drupal 8 uses PSR4 as loading, um, these two rules apply here. And one test class per feature or per, or per file. So again, in Drupal 7, you'd have one .test file with all of your classes in it. Uh, in Drupal 8, we tend to split them out into separate. Each feature has its own file, or each class has its own file, depending on the type of test. Uh, and then each method within the test needs to start with the word test, so that PHP that knows it's a test and will then run it. Different types of tests, which we'll talk about in a moment, but they all follow the same um, format. You start off by arranging, so you maybe have a, a, some setup steps, so you maybe need users or some nodes or, or a queue or, or something, like just setting up, creating the world. Uh, the second phase is acting, so something needs to happen in order to, to um, maybe a user gets create, um, activated or logged in or, or a queue item gets processed. And then once that happens, we can then write assertions to say, we think something should have happened and then just verify whether that did happen or not. Uh, so this is a, an example test case. Um, we can see that uh, also it's a PHP class. Um, the file name in this case, uh, we can see at the top is example test.php. Um, that matches the name of our class. Uh, the namespace is, uh, we've put this in a functional directory because it's a functional test and that matches our namespace. We can see the word functional there too. Uh, because this is a, a browser test, we're gonna extend the browser test space class and then we add our test method where in this case we're gonna test something. Uh, and within that we do our, do our three steps. So what type of things we test? These are some of the things that came to mind recently based on the work I've been doing. Um, creating nodes with data from an API. Uh, calculating attendance figures for an event. There's a theme here. The project I've been doing recently is an event booking website. So there's lots of event-based sort of examples. Um, determining if an event is purchasable, if it's between certain dates, if there are spaces, etc. There's lots of logic around that. Um, all new users get money off their first event, so we have to create those automatically. Uh, cloning events, people want leaders and would clone their own events, so uh, we've added that functionality there. Uh, queuing private messages, um, so in this example, we can, an event leader can bulk message everybody on an event, which may be 500 people or hundreds of people. Uh, we don't wanna do those in one request, we queue them up, which is a, went into a, a, a separate module called private message queue. Um, but there are tests that confirm that given this num this number of users on this event, on this product, this number of um, items are queued. Um, emails for new memberships. Um, closed support tickets are reopened when they're commented on. So yeah, these are some examples I've come up with recently. Um, custom form validation rules. So if your title can only be 10 characters long, we want we can test that. So this is by no means an exhaustive list. These are just <laughs> come to mind based on what I've been doing recently. Um, water test first. Uh, what is the core, this is an interesting question. What is the core piece of functionality? So what is the thing that's going to, what's the thing that you want to break the least, right? So in this case, in our event booking website, obviously people need to be able to book onto an event, but that's, that's the crucial thing that we want. Uh, if an event only has 10 places, and five people have signed up, then there's obviously five places left. If there's more than that, people go onto a wait list, et cetera. So that's our core piece of functionality that we want to test in, the, in this case. Uh, what provides the most value to the client? So obviously thinking about this from more an agency perspective. Um, obviously anything that involves money, 
we want to uh, make sure that that doesn't, that doesn't break. Uh, um, for me, what would I not want to be fixing on a Friday afternoon or doing, <laughs> doing an evening? So again, peace of mind, I don't have to worry about breaking every piece of websites by pushing a code at uh, a commit at five o'clock. Essentially, it's what would have the largest negative impact to a, a client or to a, someone's site if it was to fail. Um, this is a tweet I saw at Laravel Live UK a couple of weeks ago, which pretty much sums it up. Uh, the number one test you should write is for the thing that you lose your job for if it breaks. Uh, I can speak to this from experience, unfortunately. It's another story, let's not go there. Um, essentially, it comes down to this for me. Um, there's an example I hear, uh, a reason I hear a lot is we can't start writing tests because there's been no test before on a project. Um, which to me doesn't sort of make sense. The project I'm on, I took over six months in, there were no tests. I wrote one, we now have 45, 46, I think. So there's never a bad time to start writing tests for your project. Um, and when you start adding some new functionality, write a new test for that piece of functionality, which is what I did. Um, and also when you fix your bug, you can add a regression test to make sure that you've actually fixed the bug. So you can use a test to replicate the steps to reproduce the bug in the first place. You write your assertions to say that actually this thing should happen because of the bug, it's going to fail. You then fix the code that fixes the bug, and then the test passes. So you know now that you fixed the bug. And also, because you've got that test, you can't then re-add the same bug again because the test would fail. So you know that you've introduced the same bug. Can't happen. So there are different types of tests, as I mentioned. Um, UD tests are probably the one that most people are familiar with. Um, it's the one that PHP unit so it does by default, being called PHP unit. Um, sometimes automated testing gets clumped in as a general term called unit testing, but there are, I'd say, different types. Um, Drupal has, a, or Drupal 8 at least, has another level called kernel testing. So uh, again, this wasn't there in Drupal 7. And then we've got functional and functional JavaScript testing. So we'll come to this more in a second. Uh, so unit tests cover just your PHP logic. So they're very common in PHP libraries and standalone scripts. Um, there's no database interaction or any, anything like that. It's just testing your PHP code. If you want to say, interact with a database, you're having to make a mock database and interacting with that. So you can't put in a real database, for example. Um, because of this, because you're just testing PHP code, they're really fast to run, which is a, a good thing. Uh, as I said, if you want to sort of inject a database or, or some sort of dependency, um, you need to, to mock that out because they don't, Unit testing is you're just testing what's in just this class or just this method. It shouldn't sort of know about what things you're injecting. So you need to uh, mock them out. We won't talk about that too much. Um, but because of this, they can become very tightly coupled. Your tests match what your mock is doing. So um, in the case of a database, it's, you're probably fairly safe. But let's say if you're interacting with an API, and rather than hitting the actual real API, you make your own mock version of the API your tests all pass because they match against what your mock is doing. So then if the read API changes, then your, your unit test will still pass, but the actual real the thing will still fail because you're not testing the right thing. So be a little bit careful about mocking things. So I tend to, to avoid it where I can. Um, because of this high coupling, they can be really hard to refactor. So in a, in a really sort of worst case example, you could say, if we mock out um, a thing, we could then say that we've got to call uh, a method on it three times, let's say. Uh, and, that could, and that would pass. But then what we then can't do is refactor our code because the code, the test expects us to have the same methods and the same number of calls and the same everything. Um, so again, just be sort of mindful and try not to tightly couple things too much. Um, this is an example of unit test. So this has come from the advanced queue module. So this is not one that I wrote. Um, we can see it's just creating a job. So you go onto a queue, um, you give it um, the job type, which in this is test, and an array of data. And then we're just writing assertions based on, um, on that. So um, you can see it's a unit test because it extends the unit test case. Um, it's within the, a unit directory, although it doesn't have to be, but best practice says it and probably should. Um, it's called the job test because it's testing the job class. And it's called the create test create method because it's testing the create method on, on a class. So normal unit testing, you mirror those two up so you're 
class name matches the thing that you're testing and then methods will match the method you're testing. So, so yeah, so we create our job, we then run getters on it essentially to check that we've got the right things. So again, we're just testing what's this, what this P3 class is doing, it's not interacting with anything else. Uh, curl test or integration test, these are like unit test plus. So in, the, in integration tests, we can call up the services. So we can inject a real database and have real users and real, uh, real everything, which is nice. Um, they use a, not a full Drupal bootstrap. Um, these are sort of a lower level Drupal installation, uh, which makes them faster than the functional tests, but then slower than kernel tests because there's more stuff to do. Uh, and you do need to do more setup to get them to run, um, which you'll see in a minute. Um, so this is a kernel test, again, it's very similar to, you know, it's a PHP class, looks very similar to what unit test does. Um, we're extending a different test space, so we're extending a kernel test space this time, and we'll put it into a kernel directory. Again, it's coming from the advanced queue module. Uh, and in here, we've got, when I said we've got more setup to do, this is what I meant. So we need to install the advanced queue schema, so the table for the advanced queue data to go into, so it doesn't do that for us by default. We need to create a queue, because again, it doesn't do that for us. And we need to then get the, um, the queue processor out of the container. So um, again, because it's a curl test, we can get it from the real container and get, so we've got a real processor rather than having to, to mock it. So yeah, so install our schema, create our queue, and then get our processor. Um, once we've done the setup steps, um, then we can actually run tests. Um, so we start by doing our range step where we create some jobs put the jobs onto the queue, and we can then process the queue, and then count the number of items we've got processed. So, as we see, we've got uh, four jobs, first job, second job, third job, fourth job. Each one gets put onto the queue, process the queue, and then we're saying that we should have four items that are being processed. And then, finally, we've got functional tests, which test end-to-end -end functionality. So, we're not testing PHP code directly, but we are testing is your actual functionality in a browser, essentially behind the scenes. Um, again, we do act interact with services and, and the database. And it does use a, a full Drupal installation behind the scenes, so when you're running a test, behind the scenes it actually is installed in Drupal, um, not the standard installation, but is installed using a, a test profile, but this is all happening behind the scenes. Um, Famous thing of using vhat, it uses the same um, link drivers um, for, for PHP instances. Um, because of this, that means it's slower to run because it's got to do a Drupal install <laughs> behind the scenes. So um, we're probably talking maybe a sort of 10 second minimum to run this test just to do everything. Um, unit test, you're probably looking at milliseconds. Integration test, you're probably seconds. And these are probably, uh, can get into minutes quite easily if you're testing lots of things. Um, and, and each test method starts with, with a fresh installation. So if you're running lots of tests and lots of test methods, you've got lots of installs happening behind the scenes. And then functional tests we can have with JavaScript, and then or we can have them without JavaScript. Um, they are without by default, and then there's a, a separate functional JavaScript test case that we can extend if you need JavaScript. So in this case, uh, we can extend the browser test base class. Uh, we can do things like placing blocks on a page. We can create users, um, so we can create a user with the administer advanced queue permission, and then log that user in. We still need to create our queue uh, in, in the test method. Then we can actually call um, Drupal get, which makes a get request, so essentially goes to this page, um, goes to the admin config page of this queue, runs, uh, submits the form, so clicks the button that says delete, and then asserts that you're on the right page. So you should then get taken, once you click delete, you go back to the admin um, form. So it's actual doing real sites, behind the scenes, checking, making real requests, checking real responses, and actually testing response codes as well. Uh, and again, once because we've deleted the queue, um, when we load the queue up again, um, there should be uh, an empty queue, there should be no queue. Uh, and for most cases, um, they follow the same sort of structure. So they all have um, an assert, uh, assert, assert empty, um, only has one argument, because uh, each argument thing is empty. You may, if you're doing something like an assert count, 
you could tell, say how many you were expecting to have in, in that array, uh, and you could also put in a, a, an optional message at the end. So rather than this array equals that array, uh, we can say there's something you know, a bit more descriptive for us. So how do we know which type of test to use? Um, if you need a browser, use a functional test. If you need to interact with services but don't need a browser, you can drop down and, and use a curl test. And then if you're not interacting with those things, we can then drop that again and use pseudo tests. Um, so it comes down to use the right test case for your, the right test type and the right test case for your scenario. Um, but it's not that obvious which one it is um, all the time. So uh, recently I was testing blocks uh, on a page and I started using functional tests and then sort of realized that actually do I need to be testing the block gets rendered properly because core sort of covers that for me? Or should I check that I'm using the right render array in my block plugin? I just, because like, Drupal's got rendering blocks, right? We give it the render array and it does the block for us. So we don't really need to test that bit. But for my custom code, I want to make sure I'm giving Drupal the right array. Uh, and the answer might be both. You might want to do um, the functional test and the kernel test, but yeah. So it's not that obvious always which type to use, and you might have a different type of test depending if you use a different approach. Uh, set up methods, so functional tests give us methods like Drupal create user, Drupal create role, log in, log out, Drupal get, make get requests, Drupal post, get post requests. Um, curl tests give us similar things, but we have to extend certain traits. So there's a user creation trait that gives us methods like create user and create role, check permissions. Uh, a certain mail trait for catching emails that get sent during our test. And then some examples of assertions are um, so true is that false equals same. We tend to get sort of an assertion and then the opposite assertion. So we can test if it's null or not null or empty or not empty or equal or not equal. Most of these, these ones all come from PHP itself. Um, these are some more Drupal specific ones. So we can assert based on the current session that we're in and we can check that the page will contain certain text or not or if a, a link exists or um, if a status code equals uh, a certain value. So if a page exists, we should get a 200 response. If it doesn't exist, we should get a 404 response, for example. Okay, I'm keeping an eye on the time because lunch. Um, real life example. So client project I was working on recently, uh, had an integration with, uh, with this. Anybody familiar with Brawbean? Okay, um, it's a, a, a service that people from the client was going on to putting in job specs essentially. And when they submitted the form, they got posted to various job board websites. Um, and then also they wanted to include their website in this. So we need to build the integration. Let's just do this quickly. There we go. So the adverts were created in, in Brawlbean and we needed them to appear as nodes in Drupal. Um, we'd have to build the application URL based on um, the job role ID. Um, they use a separate application system, so we had to link off to that. Um, jobs need to be linked to offices, so offices were nodes in Drupal as well. Um, but obviously they, they'd send us just an XML feed, so we have to compare the word, say Bristol or London, uh, do we have a job, uh, a, an office node called that? And if we do, we need to link them together using entity reference. Um, job length is specified number of days, so they tell us it's active for three days or five days or seven days. We need to convert that into a date field to, to be able to use it in views and Drupal things. Um, they, just specify that they wanted to specify the path the job was going to be at in the XML, so we, we included that. And as I said, we had to build up the application URL based on parameters and later on also include uh, UTM parameters. Um, so this is essentially what was going on, Broadbean, Drupal, and then the uh, CRM the application was using. So they'd give us XML data, we'd make job nodes with it, and then we'd display the application URL to the users, they would click it and go to their um, CRM system to, to make an application. Uh, this is an array of the data that we're getting, so we get a command, so it's essentially add a, job, add a job or delete a job. We get some syndication details, how many, how many days the thing's active for. This is 365, so it's a year. Uh, branch name, so again, that, we'd have to link that to a, to a node. Uh, let's see, this job title we use as the, as the node title. Keywords, they give us a comma-separated list. We have to split these out and store them as tags. 
uh, so, and yeah, URL alias, which is the one that we're using to generate the path that, uh, we, that we would use. So this was my test data I took off their website, and this is what I used in my tests. Um, so we added a route, this is, yeah, this is the Drupal 8, by the way. So we added a route to accept the data as ex as from their XML, um, added a system user, so just one that just the API could authenticate against, um, using the, a module I wrote called system user module. Uh, I'm not that great at naming things. Um, we'd authenticate against that user. We'd convert the active form. So if they said three days, we'd convert that into an actual date. So three days from today, store it as a timestamp. Uh, branch names, we'd convert into plain text and store them as entity reference. And then we'd map the URL alias to the, uh, the node path. Um, so essentially, if there was no errors, we created the job node and then give a, a, a response back to Gorbean and they would use that. Uh, if we threw an exception, um, they, for the first while, created used job locations that didn't exist. So we threw an exception because we couldn't link to job a job that obviously didn't have. Um, so we returned back an error code, uh, an error code to Gorbean. And then testing goals. So um, essentially, we just want to make sure the job nodes are created. Again, if there are no job nodes, they, they're losing money because people can't apply for jobs. Um, assure the fields are mapped correctly. Ensure that our calculations are correct, so our number of days being a prime example, and then ensure that entity references are linked correctly. And we're pretty much using the whole spectrum of tests for this. So we start using um, unit tests for current number of days, because it's just a pretty simple calculation. Um, kernel tests to ensure that our job nodes are created properly and um, the expired ones are deleted afterwards and that our application URL is generated correctly. Uh, functional tests to make sure our job nodes are created, again, with the correct response code and that, uh, uh, the, the correct path, the path that they gave us to use. Uh, and we ended up having to update the application URL with JavaScript because when we pushed it to live, um, we're using UTM parameters and the host stripped them out so we couldn't do it with a PHP code getting the response. So we had to do it with JavaScript, um, which felt a bit icky at the time. Um, but because we had the test there, I was more comfortable with with taking that approach. Um, so we had zero bugs, which is pretty awesome. Uh, we did have some things we had to sort of debug. Um, it turned out to be issues on, on the, the broad beans on the API side where the fields had been uh, merged and separated. Um, but this is where the tests really sort of paid for themselves, essentially, because we could say that given this set of data, it will work. And because if it's not coming to us in that set of data, then you've broken something on your side. And, and as I say, easier to identify where the issues were. So various options for running tests. Uh, we can use an UI, so the simple test module is still there. Uh, we can click which ones to use. We can press run tests. We get the progress bar that shows you the number of tests that you're running at that point. We get the summary message, uh, how long it took to run, how many passes or failures that we had and we can break it down and see exactly what, what, what to run. Um, there is a, a run test or sh file in, in core that um, the test bot uses. Um, we can run that with, uh, using PHP. We can specify arguments like the module or, or the class to run. Uh, we can call PHP directly. So we need to configure a file called um, php.xml. Um, core does not include one by default because you have to customize it. Uh, for your project. Um, so you have to copy the xml.dist file that comes with core, add and change anything as needed. So you want to specify your base URL and your database credentials and uh, an output directory. So you can, simp uh, you can make, if you're doing get requests, it will take the HTML that gets them in the response and write them into HTML files, which is really great for debugging. So we can specify the output directory for that. And then um, for test-driven, code, I tend to always put stop and failure equals true, because I want it to stop as soon as it hits the first failure, rather than continuing on and telling me that you know, there are 10 failures, I just want to know that there's, there's just one failure, what the first one is. Um, so I can go into a, a web directory where my Drupal site lives. Um, in this case, my vendor directory is one, one level higher. Um, we can run the PHP unit executable from uh, the vendor bin directory. We need to tell it where our config file lives. Uh, it lives inside the core directory. And then we can specify the path to the module that we want to use. So in this case, we're putting an examples module. And within that, there's a PHP unit examples module with PHP unit example tests. Um, 
it's another site modification. You could go into the core directory itself. You don't need to specify the config directory because you're already there, but you do need to go back up another level to find the code that you want to uh, test. Again, there's various arguments that we can pass. Um, filter is probably my favorite one. So you can say just run this one test method on a class. We couldn't do that with simple test. Um, we can also do them by group. Uh, or I have them integrated in my IDE. So in PHP Storm, there's a, a little sort of green arrow next to this. I can just press that and run that one test. I can run them on a, on a whole file, which is nice. And then test-driven development is the process of um, writing a test first, watching the test fail, because we've not written any code yet, um, then write the code that our test passes. And because we're now passing, we can then refactor that code we already wrote and then just carry on taking that approach. So it's not the only way to do it. It's the way um, I try and do both things. Um, this is the same process for the diagram. So failing test, test pass, refactor. It's that constant sort of circular, circular loop, um, commonly just called red for any refactor. And this has been how I've been pro porting my modules to Drupal 8, um, making new branches, moving across the test first, and then writing the code for Drupal 8 to make the test pass, which is uh, node option is a good example. Uh, let's see. So. I tend to use an outside-in approach. So rather than writing lots of unit tests and mocking lots of things, I tend to start at the functional test level and then just drop down um, to a lower level where, where I can do so, essentially. Um, programming by wishful thinking is just writing the code you wish you had and then letting the test fail and say, hey, you don't have a class called the toolbar class, so I'll go and make one and then relet the test sort of guide what your um, next steps are. And sometimes I'll write the assertions first on the way backwards. Uh, okay, we'll go through this five minutes or so left, so I'll go through this pretty quickly. So how do we make a new module using test-driven test -driven approach? So this is our acceptance criteria. I'm assuming we're all familiar with this sort of thing. Um, so as a site visitor, I want to see a list of articles uh, slash blog. I want to see them ordered by the post date. So my tasks are to ensure that the page exists, first of all. Uh, to check that only the published ones are shown, so we won't exclude any unpublished ones, and then ensure that they're in the right order. And for this, we can use the views module to just uh, to save on some code. Uh, and let's just do the minimum length at every step, and the tests of guide us what the next thing is. I always we'll start with functional tests and, and do the inside end approach. So the very first thing to do is create our module. Um, so we make a new module, TDD underscore blog. Uh, so we make an info file. So this is the minimum amount we need to make our module enableable so we can install it. And then we can start writing tests. So in this case, let's just skip through here. So we can extend um, the browser test space because it's a functional test. So we can enable the module that we're testing, currently the, the one we're writing. Uh, and then we can test our page exists. So we can go to the blog page using Drupal get and then check that we should get a 200 response. So everything should be okay. Uh, we can run our command. It tells us what we're testing. We get an exception that was thrown, and the exception that's thrown is this expectation exception that because um, our page say, doesn't exist. We said it should exist. We should get a 200, but we get a 404 because we haven't built a page yet. Uh, we get a stack trace, and we get the little um, summary again. And because we haven't, this is because we haven't built our view, right? We haven't done that yet. Um, so we can make a new view, and we can create a display with a page and set the path. We can export the config, put it into our install directory, and make it work. So this is how, I'm pretty sure we've all seen views, right? So this is how we build a blog. Um, let's int intentionally, let's leave the type to all, and let's not sort them or anything by default, just to see what that does. Um, so we set our path. Um, we can run address CX to export our config and then copy it into our module. There are some slight changes. We could take out this UUID and uh, any default hashes just to make it not specific to our site, to make it generic. Uh, and now we get a different error. So we've made progress. So anytime we can move to a different error, that's great. And this is essentially just saying that there are, um, our view needs some dependency. So we need uh, an article called the type, makes sense. And we need node module and views module because we haven't given those yet. Uh, we can add those as dependencies. 
in our module. And now we get less dependency errors. So we still need to add the article content type. So we can do that and put it into our config directory and now our test passes. So rather than an exception, we get an okay and one test has passed. We can check that one off. Um, publish articles, I tend to write these out sort of given when then sort of steps um, out. So given I've got a mixture of published and unpublished content, when I go to the page, I should only see the published articles. So we can do this with functional test um, by creating some nodes, going to the page, and then checking that the actual page contain the HTML contains these pieces of text. Or we can drop down and do a kernel test. So slightly different, because we can use a node creation trait this time to give us the create node method we don't, as we don't have them. And this just makes it faster to run because we don't have to do a full Drupal install. But we can do the same steps. We can create our content types and our status. And if we run it now, we get this error about member to call, call to member function or ID or boolean. Because we're running PHP tests, we get PHP errors. And some of them hard to debug. Um, in this case, it's because we need to install the filter module or install the config for the filter module. So when I said there's more setup to do, this is what I meant, because you get these <laughs> error messages get, that get thrown. Um, rather than going to the page, we can call views get view result to get the actual results back out of our view programmatically. And still need to enable our modules. We need to enable, uh, install the config for our module, because we need to do that to install our view. And based on this set of um, content, we should get one result, because this is a page, so this shouldn't be returned. This one isn't a published article, that should be. This one's unpublished, that shouldn't be. So out of this, we should get one result. Uh, and out of that, we can say it should be node two. And because they're reset on every method, then we can safely say it should be node two. Um, we run it, we get a failure because we've said it should be um, two. We've, we've said it, um, it's not that. Um, so this is because we've only got one filter on our view. So we get the default, the default published one. So we can add our filter. Well, this is pretty quick now, so I'm out of time. Um, we can add our extra, extra filter to our article. And now the test passes. And the last step is just to make sure order by the date. And this is where using a kernel test is, um, is much, much better. Because we couldn't do this really easy with a functional test. So in this case, we can make some articles and change the published dates, uh, the created dates. So and they're intentionally in the wrong order. So if you can see this, they're one plus one day, plus one month, plus three days, plus one hour. So we're intentionally in the wrong order, so we see that test fail. Um, yeah, this is the same thing. We can get our results back out. And in this case, we can just call array map and get our IDs back out from the results array. So essentially what we have now is an array of node IDs in the order that the view is, is, the view is gonna give them to us in, and we can just make assertions on them. So I can say that the ID should be 4132 because that's the order I've specified them in up here. So this was gonna fail. And I'd tell, I say 4132 and they come back as 1234 because we're always ordered by node ID um, by default. And we can, because again, there's no sort criteria, we haven't specified one. So we can add it, we can re-export our view. We can put the extra sort criteria on the bottom and our test passes. So now we've covered all three of these things. Whether we should be testing views is maybe an interesting subject, interesting discussion, but for the point of the example. Um, this is what our module looks like with our configuration included in our tests. And then this is what would happen if we actually did boot up the site. So we've installed it with a minimal install profile, so there's no pretty Baltic theme. And we can see we've got blog post one, blog post two, blog post three is unpublished, it doesn't show up, and then we have blog post four. So a real working blog <laughs> in a Drupal 8 website using PDB. Awesome. So some quick takeaways. Let's go through these pretty quickly. Time. There we go. Um, testing has made me a, a better and more confident developer. I can say that quite confidently. Um, testing can produce better quality code because you can get less bugs. Um, use the right type of test for the right situation. So maybe not always that obvious which one to use. Um, and then use the right base class because there's various entity, various kernel tests, particularly I found 
so you can call on how to do less setup, which is, uh, which is great, and then use te the available traits. Uh, and then writing tests is an investment as well. So they take time to run, uh, take time to write and run, but they should save you then time later on because you don't have to fix so many bugs and everything else as well. As I say, they're e quicker and easier to fix now than they are when they've been in production for six months. Um, start small, our tests gradually, um, and then we can also because we've got tests, we call them, we can refactor our code. Like a number of times I've seen people say, hey, we'll refactor that at the end of the sprint, and they probably never do because they're worried about breaking everything again. Whereas with, now we've got tests, we can break, st uh, we can change stuff without breaking it because we've got the tests. Um, and just be aware the tests can pass, but things can be broken because they only report on, they only pass the test that you wrote. As I said, just because we've got tests means there's no bugs. Um, be sure to test in the UI still. Don't heavily rely on, on testing. And yeah, you may not include a certain test case or, or something, so there can still be bugs. Um, yes, yeah, so you might be testing the wrong thing. I did this recently. Or maybe it doesn't work quite the way you think it's supposed to work. Um, I had a test that was passing recently and then I found I had to do something slightly differently to make it fail. Um, if you're still getting failures, maybe you haven't covered all the different scenarios. Maybe you've only covered sort of the happy path. You haven't sort of checked for the negative use cases as well, or what if you pass in an incorrect value? So try and include those as well. Um, and other modules could do things. So I had tests in a module that passed recently, and then on the actual site they failed because another module was doing something. So just be aware of that. Testing can add time now, but save more time in the future. So again, it's that investment thing. And, and the practice makes perfect. The more tests you write, the quicker you'll get at, the quicker you'll get at writing them. But also, uh, I found base classes to extend that I didn't know about maybe a month ago. And yes, yeah, start small. Some tests are better than no tests. Um, I did this talk at, at a user group recently, and this was a Slack message I got from um, some the, the event organizer afterwards. You can see where she's uh, got this little green bar where she's been writing tests uh, that are passing. So that was pretty cool. And, and yeah, this is what she said afterwards as well, is uh, the talk lead drove her to write tests, and it's given her peace of mind and helped her uncover the bugs she wouldn't have done otherwise. So to me, it was the same thing. When I started writing tests, I'm like, ah, there's a bug there. I didn't check that bug. So she doesn't know if I put this tweet in, so hopefully that's okay. Um, and yes, Futurama quote, when you do things right, people won't know you've done anything at all. Very applicable to testing, I think. Um, I realize that we're slightly over. So if anybody has questions, or I'm around for today, I'm heading home tomorrow, but um, if you have questions, you can ask me later on today, or... Questions? Thank you. Um, Sorry. <laughs> for for uh, functional tests, is it possible to use uh, the a sync directory for setting up for the setup of a test, so you don't have to uh, redefine all your content types, all your fields on the your content types, etc. Because recently on a project, I uh, tried uh, that um, approach, mm -hmm. and uh, but uh, the uh, testing system. Uh, didn't want to use my the, my sync directory. I tried to indicate it. Okay. Yeah. So the question was, can can I specify what configuration to use when yeah, writing the tests? Yeah. To to avoid to avoid the um, to avoid um, because we didn't use features on this project. We use mm -hmm. CMI, so uh, our custom modules didn't uh, have the configuration in config install config optional. Uh, so uh, uh, to avoid uh, in the tests to have a lot of setup <coughs> to do, uh, I wanted to reuse the sync directory, and it was mm. it wasn't possible. So I wanted to know if someone else or you have uh, tried this, that approach. Yeah, um, I've looked into it and also had the same problem. So yeah, I've not been able to do it yet, but uh, and I've got the same scenario. So given we've got you know events which are products and they've got maybe twenty fields on them a lot of this copying and pasting going on between things and also then our, our live configuration uses field permission and our test ones don't which doesn't make that, se that much sense um, in Drupal 7 I probably would have used features and, and maybe for Drupal 8 I'm still thinking about whether that might be the right sort of approach so that the, the feature I'm enabling has the same configuration that the live we're having um, I need to look at that a bit more 
and I'm also quite interested in the, in the CMI2 initiative to see the improvements that are going on there, like we can now, or should be able to should soon, install a new site using the same set of configuration. Mm -hmm. So that also may help, but yeah, it, I've got the same headache, <laughs> essentially. So yeah, the more copy, less copy and pasting I can do, the better. Thank you. Yeah, I can repeat, yeah, okay. Uh, what do you think is the best? <laughs> what do you think is the best way to discover these base classes and traits for using in our tests? The best because way to find them? Um, yeah, to investigate, to, I don't know. I'm trying to think, so I, an example recently, I was using the base, there's a, a kernel test base, which is up to the, the lowest level one, and I was having to do the same setup setups every time, so I have to install the same um, system schema table, I think, was the one I had to do and repeat the same steps. And then afterwards, I found there's an entity kernel test base that does some of the steps for me. I could take out pretty much five steps from every test I was doing. Um, how I came across that, I can't remember. <laughs> but, um, and again, this comes back to documentation. It, it quite possibly could have been I was working on a different module, maybe something like advanced queue or, or something, and then found that that module was using a different class or maybe core was using it. Um, that's probably how I found it. But, um, so you recommend like reading other tests that are similar to the functionality there? Yeah, exactly. Um, I think the ones uh, for private message queue, I, I looked at, um, fortunately the part of the queue module has, and, and the examples module has some good examples, obviously, as well, uh, of things we can use, so. Yeah, and again, once you sort of found that, it, once I found that, now again, that's m I'm more productive because I don't need to copy the same steps every time. But yeah, not or uh, the other thing is if you're using um, a good IDE, you can look at c um, entity um, kernel test base and then see the classes that extend that. That may have been how I found it. So you can, yeah. in my idea, I can just click a little arrow and there should be a list of all the ones that are built on top of that. And then obviously they extend the same functionality. So that's probably, it. that might be also how I found it. Yeah, I think that's the best. Thank you. <laughs> oh, still there. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Uh, do you think that could be a great idea if we create tests, like a contribution, even before that to have the patch? Like, because normally now when I see the issues, like we have a patch to solve a bug, and then we ask for a test. But maybe, I don't know, I cannot create the patch, but maybe I can do the test and maybe it can be a contribution even before the patch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it depends, I guess, on your workflow. So you could write the patch first and write the test afterwards, or you could do it test first and then do um, the thing afterwards. What I'll tend to do is write, if I'm putting an issue, uh, sorry, if I'm putting a patch on an issue, I'll submit two patches. I'll submit one with the test that fails, so I can show that the, there is a bug, mm -hmm. and then I'll submit another patch in, as the same comment and then say this is the one with the test, but also the fix. Yeah, but I mean like, if I'm not gonna put the patch, mm -hmm. I, if you think that it's a good idea only to put the test, oh, like yeah. it's failing, mm -hmm. and now we need to continue working. Yeah, there's, there's a, um, I remember looking, not recently, but uh, a little while ago, the number of issues with the news test yeah. label. And if, if I wanna contribute to something, that's what I normally look for, because I can do that. So there's probably quite a lot of them. Um, yeah, if you could write the test first and just verify the debug, and then it should be easy then for somebody else then to come along and say, hey, I fixed that bug now because this test is already there. So yeah, maybe don't put it in these tests because you've already got the test. So I think it's a good idea. Uh, thank you, it was a great uh, presentation. Thank you. Uh, small question, uh, functional tests are quite slow. Mm -hmm. and uh, it uh, destroys our uh, completely motivation to write them because uh, it takes a lot of time uh, uh, to debug the test itself. Okay. Uh, can you share your experience of how, do, how did you deal with this situation? How did you accelerate your uh, test uh, performance? Uh? Yeah, it's, it's a tricky one. Um, they do take long to run because they're doing so many more things behind the scenes. There's having to do a full Drupal install behind the scenes to do everything. Um, and yeah, I think we've got on the project I'm doing now uh, about 45 tests. They take about 10 minutes or so to run. So they take a while. Um, 
how do I make them more performant? Uh, I, get, I only really use functional tests when I need to. So if I wanted to go to a page, check the page exists, uh, check response codes, uh, what else do I use pages for? They're the main reasons I want to use functional tests. Most of the tests I write will be kernel tests. And they're obviously faster to run. So you're probably looking at maybe sort of seven or eight seconds to run a test rather than maybe 20 or 30 seconds. And that over 45 tests helps, uh, will improve, improve the performance. I think out of 45, maybe five or six of them are functional tests. There's not that many of them. Most of them are kernel tests because they give me the flexibility to use the container and to use real objects and test render arrays for blocks and things. And then, yeah, I always tend to do functional tests when I can. So, uh, and I guess locally as well, I only maybe run the tests that I'm sort of really working on. And then I'm sort of working, I'll run everything in the custom directory, maybe just before doing a deploy, just to make sure like something isn't broken. Or Jenkins or GitLab or something can do that as well. So when you push a new commit to a, to a branch, that could be running the tests for you behind the scenes as well. And then you're not having to run them on your laptop or your workstation. So yeah, maybe just only use functional tests where you can. <laughs> maybe that's, that's been my approach. Yeah, and, and we've been looking at, I've been trying to think of a better way. Um, we've been using um, SQLite for databases. Um, recently, one of my coworkers was looking at running in memory SQLite, so that should be faster. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm curious also to find faster ways of running the test, because although I still look at it and think, hey, maybe that took a minute to run, but that will still be faster than waiting it. So from, if I'm working on some code, it'll go to our internal QA tester. She'll have to test it, or he'll have to test it before it goes live. So that's, that minute is still quicker than them failing it, or quicker than it going to code review, or quicker than it going to production. It's still, it's still saving me time, even though it's not as quick as I'd like to run in the first place, unfortunately. Hello. Yeah, um, what do you think about Behat? Could be an alternative to functional test, or yeah. another thing, or? Um, yeah, so Behat and functional test are sort of doing the same thing. Uh, and they use the same driver. So in one of those examples, you can see it's throwing a bhat link expectation exception. It's the same code as being used. Um, the difference being the syntax that you use to get the test to run. So in these cases, we're using PHP. I'll tend to write the comments out and do given when then sort of comments and still by syntax by PHP. Obviously with bhat, you can run Gherkin and actually write them out that way. Um, yeah, I, I tend just to stick to using the PHP init functional test because I, it's one less thing to add as a dependency to the project. But maybe, um, I, I've used Behat on, on Symfony and Laravel before. So it's, it's a nice tool, but for Drupal, I've tended to stick to using um, these functional tests. And they do, they say, they do pretty much the same thing, just a slightly different way. Any more questions? I know it's lunchtime. It's probably a big queue now. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Mucho obrigado.